Okay, so here's the, I'm going to start the next lecture here. Um, so we're covering sculpture this week. Um, okay, we'll get started. This is the, these are the learning object, objectives. I'm actually in my son's room right now. I'm having a hard time finding places at home to work. Um, anyway, so we're going to compare examples of freestanding, low relief, and high relief sculpture. Uh, we're going to describe the kind of the methods of sculpture, so modeling, casting, carving, constructive techniques of sculpture. Um, we'll describe and define kinetic sculpture. Uh, we'll talk about parameters and components of mixed media sculpture. And we'll discuss, you know, artist's use of installation and site-specific art to transform the surroundings. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about, uh, Martin Purrier, CFAO 2006. Um, or seven, painted and unpainted pine and a found wh wheelbarrow. So here it is. Um, it's actually quite high. It's eight and a half or eight inches, eight feet high, sorry. Um, and you can walk around this piece and, you know, from the front, it just looks like kind of a stack, a kind of a chaotic stack of um, pine wood on top of this old wheelbarrow. But if you walk around the back of it, you'll see that there's kind of a kind of a African mask shaped um, elongated elongated face shape here in the back of it if you walk all the way around um, and the artist painted this white and with a three-dimensional sculptural piece you pretty much just have to walk all the way around it and view it from all sides because it's 3d obviously and you really need to in order to understand it and appreciate it you really do need to view it from all angles so free, um, freestanding and relief sculpture, um, sculpture meant to be seen from all sides is called in the round or freestanding. Um, as we move around it, our experience of the sculpture uh, becomes the sum of its various sides and angles. So sometimes they have photos of a single view of a sculpture and you're just not going to get the full impression of the sculpture from one single photo. Sometimes we need fo multiple photos that show more angles and sides. And obviously a video that kind of takes you around the whole thing is even better, but honestly to see it in person is probably the best, the best way to do it. So with this piece by Purrier, we looked at it is a freestanding sculpture that has different sides and can show different impressions depending on the position of the viewer because when you walk the, around the back of that you see that there is actually kind of that African white shaped mask in the back of it. Where, when, when you're viewing it from the front you would never guess that it was there. So, um, so a sculpture that is not freestanding but projects from a background surface is called uh, relief. Low relief, some, sometimes called bas relief, sculpture means that the projection from the surrounding surface is slight, so shadows would be minimal coming from a low relief sculpture. So it's basically, relief is kind of like it's a flat surface, yet it's been carved into, but not too deeply, basically, is what a low re relief is. And we're going to look at a coin, it's called the, uh, the Apollo, silver coin with Apollo, 400 BCE. So this is a old piece stamped from a mold and it is in relief because it's it does have a little bit of a 3D projection going on with the face and the nose and the eyes and the hair. Um, and this is in low relief because it's not projecting very much. Okay, so moving on. The book really doesn't have a lot to say about that coin. Um, so the next one we're going to look at that is an example of low relief is from the temple of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. It's from 1100, somewhere around 1100. It's called Army on the March. It's done in sandstone, which is actually um, a sedimentary rock. So this is considered to be a low relief sculpture. There's not, there is some carving into the stone, but it's not very deep. Um, and this was found in the, the temple of Angkor Wat, Angkor, Angkor Wat in Cambodia. 
And this was kind of the center of the empire in the 12th century. And the kings that ran this empire funded a lot of this sculpture and architecture. Um, and these are, these are sculptures or carvings that are found um, in the chambers of the complex. And they barely, like I said, they barely rise up above the background surface. So it's called Army on the March and it depicts an army commanded by a prince. And there's a lot of kind of rhythmic pattern um, through these spear carrying warriors down here. Um, and there's a lot of pattern in the foliage and the trees. Uh, the soldiers in the back background provide a setting for the prince, prince who stands with a bow and arrow po posed on the carriage on the back of an elephant. Um, there really are a lot of intricate details in this, obviously, like mostly, like I said, in the kind of in the skirts and the legs. And there's a lot of it's a pretty busy piece, actually. It's very patternistic. A lot of car carved line um, in the foliage and in the skirts that the men are wearing and um, the hair of the prince and his skirt both have, are, you know, are very, lots of lines, carved line. Um, and it's almost like a fabric, almost like a, a pattern that you might find on a fabric. So this is a, this was an example, these two, the coin and this um, relief uh, carving in sandstone from Cambodia. Th th both of those things were low relief, but we'll take a look at some high relief. Here pretty soon and this is characterized when more than half of the natural circumference of the modeled form projects from the surface so figures are often substantially undercut which means that they are popping out a lot more um, in high relief so we'll look at corporate wars wall of influence um, by robert longo it's from 1982 and i guess this is just the middle portion maybe it has more sections to it but this is in cast aluminum and it's large it's seven by nine feet um, it's kind of a jumble of male and female figures engaged in convulsing and painful conflict um, it's in high relief with a lot of undercutting there are a couple areas where limbs and garments are barely raised above the surface but as you see the heads of some of the figures they are almost completely in the round um, so if we look at this woman here, her she's almost poking out all the way. Uh, you know, his arm here is pretty high. Uh, his hand is basically, if not all the way out of the, the surface that it projects from. Um, so a lot of this, this guy's head looks like it's basically outside in this head here. So there is a lot, there's kind of a mixture of low and high, but it's mostly, it's considered high relief. Um, and there's quite a bit of dynamic gesturing and there's a lot of use of diagonal forces in the torsos and it's just kind of a, obviously, like I said, very busy and chaotic, a lot of movement, um, you know, following the limbs, you kind of end up following them around the composition in kind of a jumbled, um, chaotic way. And it's very active. It's a very active sculpture. So there's a lot of movement, um, implied movement in this piece. Obviously nothing is actually moving, but it does look like they are in the middle of an action of fighting with each other, basically. And it's basically the theme of it is just um, the artist Longo is kind of horrified by the intense competition of um, corporate life. So if we look at these people, they are dressed up in, you know, business attire with, with the, you know, ties and suits and things on so they are people from the corporate world and also it's called corporate wars wall of influence so that's kind of the theme behind this piece so we're going to get into methods and materials now um the first one the first method that we'll cover is modeling and modeling is an additive process of building up a material such as clay wax or plaster so it's like you're adding to it You'll just keep adding pieces of clay on top of each other, and then you start to kind of form it into a whatever you're making, basically. And artists work with their hands to model pliable materials. Um, they build up and push the material into its final form. Um, so we're going to look at ball play player uh, with three-part yoke and bird headdress. It's a naturalistic clay sculpture. You can see the fingerprints in it still. And then there's an armature. It was probably built on top of an armature, which is an inner 
uh, support that you use for soft materials when making a sculpture. So you would have like maybe like a wooden um, core that you would build the clay around and that is called an armature. You might eventually remove the armature or the armature might end up staying there. It kind of just depends on what you're doing with your sculpture. But here's the ball player with three-part yoke and bird headdress. This is from the Maya classic period, 600 to 800 CE. So ceramic with traces of blue pigment. So they had fired this and then, you know, painted it after that. Um, it's 13 inches high by seven inches wide. Pretty neat piece, pretty detailed. Um, maybe we'll go back. I don't think I'm quite ready to show you the um, video yet. Sorry about that. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, so there's quite a few cultures around the world that have left examples of modeled ceramics. Uh, obviously, like I said before, tool marks and fingerprint impressions are still visible on the surface of a lot of these ceramics. So somebody that made this, you know, thousands of years ago, you're going to still have fingerprints um, on the piece. And in this piece, there's a lot of body volume, natural gesture, and costume detail. And the ancient Maya lived in parts of Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras, and they used clay to create vessels and sculptures. And this is a sculpture of a player that wears a bright blue headdress. Um, and he wears a wide yoke around his waist for protection and wristbands and anklets for hitting the ball. Um, because hands were not allowed during the game. Sorry, I'll get rid of this. So they played this game in the Mayan culture, and it was done with a rubber ball um, from the rubber tree that they made. And it was a really intense game. I think lives were on the line. I think that the losers oftentimes were sacrificed to the gods. Um, it was a really hard game too, and they couldn't use their hands. So I will talk a little bit more about the Mayan ball game just because they talk about this is a ball player, but like, what is the game about? I think it's kind of interesting to see. Um, so I will just go ahead and load this really quickly. For the Maya, the sky was not the only otherworldly domain. And the gods of the sky were not the only ones that had to be appeased. Beneath the earth, there lay another vast realm, a supernatural underworld where the spirits of the dead roamed. For the Mayas, the structure of the world, we are living in the living plane, that it's the earth, and then there's the skies with different levels, and of course the underworld. The underworld was the place where the people that are not living anymore are there, so for them, when you die, is not the end of everything. In the Popol Vuh, an ancient Mayan narrative, the underworld is called Shibalba, the place of fear. It has nine perilous levels, ruled by 12 lords, gods of death, who are responsible for disease and affliction. The Maya believe this place of death exists side by side with the land of the living. The underworld could be reached in the most unlikely of places. This huge open court in Chichen Itza looks almost like a marketplace, but no buying or selling went on here. It was the setting for an ancient Mayan ball game, a game far deadlier than any modern sport. Measuring 550 by 230 feet, the court is over twice the size of a modern American football field. Here, two teams faced off, with players aiming to hit the ball through hoops high on the walls. They play for the highest possible stakes, because the losing team faces being sacrificed to the gods. The winners kill the losers and cut off their heads. Wall reliefs show the victors holding a loser's severed head. At first glance, 